Hi, good morning to everybody. Happy Tuesday. Thank you for joining us for um, Plants, Pests, and Pathogens today. Let's t take a quick minute to um, remind you of, of some of the standard things about the program. One of them is we're trying to keep track of the number of people who participate. So if you would help out by typing in your name, your county, and the number of people who are participating at your site, then that will make it easier to add up and figure out how broad our reach is. Um, if you haven't already, take a minute and, and do the audio setup so that you'll be able to ask questions with your microphone as well as with the chat box. Just a quick reminder that everything that you type in the chat box, even if you say it's just going to one person, it comes to all of the um, moderators and to the speaker. So it's very dis disrupting to the speaker to have a you know, background chat going on about other things. So please don't use the chat box except to ask questions or make a comment about uh, the presentation as it's going. You have a microphone button in the bottom left corner of your screen. If you leave that turned off, um, except when you're actually speaking, that uh, will help cut down on background noise and make it easier for everybody to, to hear. We are recording this session, and it will be available online later. Agents, you can get credit with uh, LMS if you go and register at this site, and we'd also appreciate if you'd record your ten attendance on um, the link that's there. I'm Lucy Bradley. I am the State Extension Master Gardener Coordinator and the Extension Urban Horticulture Specialist. Delighted to be with you this morning. We have lots of information about plants, pests, and pathogens, as well as access to, to, you know, to information about previous sessions. So you can, can see recordings from previous sessions. You have access to handouts. Agents, you have access to PowerPoints. All of that is linked from the um, Plants, Pests, and Pathogens website. You, uh, there's a tiny URL that's listed here that will take you there. You, you can also, if you Google me at NCSU, so Lucy Bradley at NCSU, uh, off of my home page, there's a link to Plants, Pests, and Pathogens. So you can, as you can see, you can, you can link previous um, sessions from there as well. Today's program, we've got a great lineup. Um, Danny Lauderdale and Mary Ellen Ferguson are going to be giving us some regional insights. Our featured speaker today is Brian Jackson uh, from the Horticulture Department talking about plant identification. John Biting is going to be doing showstoppers, or actually I guess um, he may be supporting us and have another presenter on showstoppers. But um, current insects is, will be by David Steffen and, and current diseases with, with Mike Munster. So buckle your seatbelt. We've got a full morning planned for you. We have the amazing Lee J. Temple, who is our, the information technologist who does all of, of the technical support for this program. And we hugely appreciate her help and assistance. Lee J., thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Hope you're having a great morning, Lucy. <laughs> I am. And I don't know, Lee J., I don't know if, you wanna, if there's any other things you want to cover about Illuminate. Um, so under the participant list, there is a hand with a green arrow pointed up. When you have a question, do that. That will um, signal, I'm going to click on one right now. That will signal that you have a question, and then we can address it if you want to turn on your microphone. Um, across from that, um, there is a green check and a red X. Those might um, stay that way, or they might turn into letters, and we'll ask you to poll. Um, so click on that green check if you can see it. Okay. Now we'll <coughs> we also have the chat box that you can type into to ask questions. Um, Lucy and I will be monitoring that, and we'll stop the presenters if um, they don't address it. Um, address your question in the chat. Um, one of the things we want to know is where you are. So, if you look just to the left of this picture, there is a toolbar that <coughs> has something that looks like a magic wand it's about halfway down. Um, if you click on that icon. You can then click on the map and show us where you are. I am in the lake. Okay. 
All right. Well, if you have any questions um, about technical, of a technical nature, you can just type those in the chat window, and I will help you as best I can. Let's see back to you. Thank you, Lee J. It's exciting to see that that we're all across the, the state. Okay. First up is Mary Helen Ferguson. Mary Helen is the extension agent in Randolph County. Mary Helen. Okay. Well, today I'm going to talk about something that came up last year, and it may be something that other people have thought about before, but I hadn't really thought about it before. And so I thought it might be a good topic for discussion before we get into the tomato season um, full blast. Let's see. Do we? Am I going to change the slides, or is somebody else going to change the slides? Um, you are. You um, are. Um, okay. okay. There you go. There you go. Okay. Thanks. So. A lot of us, or probably all of us, are familiar with blossom end rot. That happens. We probably see it most on tomatoes, but it happens on peppers and squash and watermelons and other things too. And on the left, you have a picture there from the new container gardening publications. Just wanted to point that out that uh, Lucy and some other people prepared. So blossom end rot is a result of lack of calcium in the fruit. But it's not always because you don't have enough calcium in the soil. A lot of times it can be because we have too little water or maybe you have too much water and so the roots are not functioning very well because calcium only is taken up, as I understand it, with water in the plant. It moves in the xylem, not in the phloem. And so it only moves in the direction from root to shoot. It can also happen because we have too much fertilizer, especially nitrogen, but also there are other fertilizers that can cause um, problems with calcium uptake or with excessively vigorous growth of the plant so that, uh, um, that actually I'm not completely sure that is one reason, but too much fertilizer can be one reason you have blossom in rot. In, this, in the field, usually the liming that you do because of the pH modification is enough to put enough calcium in the uh, soil for the plant. However, in container gardening, if a person is going to use a potting mix that doesn't have any nutrients, then a problem that I think people run into is that your soluble fertilizers that you buy, miracle Grow and Peters and things like that, typically are not going to have calcium in them. And it's not because the companies just want to cheat people, it's just because calcium tends to form insoluble precipitates when um, it's in there with other stuff. And so it would be a problem with getting the fertilizer to be soluble. And so I never really even thought about this, that if you're growing tomatoes in containers, and a lot of people like to do that, um, if, you're not using a, if you're using a potting mix that doesn't have any nutrients and you're only using a soluble fertilizer, there's real potential that you could end up with blossom in rot. In fact, I can't see how you wouldn't. So in thinking about how to deal with this, um, one option, of course, would be to use a potting mix with fertilizer included. And there's going to be a lot of variation, I expect, in how much calcium is in these mixes. I looked at a bag of miracle Grow fertilizer yesterday, and it didn't have any analysis of calcium in there, but it did say that some of the phosphorus was derived from calcium phosphate. So I'm not sure how much calcium that means is in there. Of course, another option would just be to use lime, and we know that lime takes a while to become available, so um, when you're just mixing lime in, if you're mixing it in right before you plant, I'm not sure how much of this is going to be available um, right at the time you're growing the tomato. So there's a question in my mind there. I still have a lot of questions about this topic still, but I thought I'd go ahead and talk about it and just put it out there, and maybe some of you have some ideas about how to deal with it. Uh, gypsum is another thing that one could use to deal with blossom and rot. And I quite, uh, sent a question to people in the Department of Soil Science last year about this. And Dr. Smith said that gypsum is about 20 times as soluble in water as calcium carbonate or lime. And so gypsum would be more likely to be available to the plant more quickly than lime would. Now, what people may run into is that they're growing their tomatoes in a container and they realize they have a blossom and rot problem. Um, of course, it's best to deal with it before planting, and so hopefully people will be able to go ahead and put something in the potting mix before they plant. But if they end up with a problem, um, of course, we like to be able to tell people what they can do to solve that problem. And Dr. Janine Davis, there was a conversation about blossom and rot and calcium several years ago in the Board Agents Listserv, and which was really interesting to me because I learned some stuff that I, I, we've, we've been making some recommendations that I'm not sure made a lot of sense. 
And uh, Dr. Davis said that she had done some research several years ago, and one thing they learned was that when they applied calcium through the drip system, it didn't really have any effect on blossom end rise. But I did find at least one place in a university they source that said applying gypsum alongside the plant um, after the fact could, could be helpful. So that's what it suggested. So um, because we like to be able to give people an idea about what they might be able to do to uh, solve the problem, these are just some ideas. If, assuming that somebody realizes pretty early on they have a blossom end rot problem and they want to put something on the soil so that they hopefully will have good food later on. Of course, liquid lime is out there. I've never used this product, but um, from what I've read, it's very soluble, and it would probably, my guess is this would probably be one of the best products for getting calcium available to the roots pretty quickly. However, it's, uh, my guess is, I, I haven't looked at the price, but it's probably um, a, a, kind of a little bit expensive, and it probably isn't very available to home gardener. Um, and because we have some questions about how effective it is to apply calcium after the fact, I'm not sure that your home gardener is going to want to go and make a purchase like this. Um, gypsum will be another option. The recommendation I've seen is one to two pounds per hundred square feet. Uh, application, of course, we have to adjust that to containers. And then calcium nitrate, of course, is a fertilizer that could be used. But if a person's going to use this, then they're going to have to find some way other than a complete soluble fertilizer to um, apply their phosphorus and potassium because you don't want to, again, put, put on too much nitrogen and maybe even make the problem worse. And one thing that I was going to mention in addition to um, this stuff was we have a lot of recommendations in some of our um, even our extension literature about foliar application of calcium as a solution for blossom end rot. And in this conversation, agents and uh, Janine Davis had several years ago, the point was made that there's really not any um, research or very little research, if any, to back up this idea that you apply foliar calcium to deal with blossom end rot because um, calcium is applied to the leaves it never makes it into the fruit. Like I said earlier, the calcium is only moving from root to shoot. It's not going to move from the leaves into the fruit. There's a time at which the fruit can take up, the fruit itself can take up calcium, but that's a pretty short amount of time as I understand it. So just to want to point out there, there's really a question of whether that recommendation of applying foliar calcium is effective. And so I've stopped making that recommendation. And finally, I've probably gone over my time limit here, but just a little bit about what our master gardeners have been doing. I've talked to some of you about this. Michelle Wallace is probably out there. She helped me with this design a little bit. But we have a new demonstration garden. Um, it's about eight-tenths of an acre, and we've been working on it for several years now. But finally, last fall, we did our woody plant planting. We planted about 42 trees and shrubs to demonstrate um, good plant selection and plant placement. And we have several other things going on right now. We have um, a pollinator conservation garden. That's one of our next steps, hopefully um, inspired by Debbie Roos's garden over there. And also a strawberry bed and a, an herb garden. We already had a vegetable garden and compost bin. So that's all I have. Thank you all. And if you have any ideas about this whole blossom and rot thing in uh, containers, then please feel free to let us all know. Thanks, Mary Helen. Thanks, Mary Helen. Okay, next up is Danny Lauderdale from Pitt County. Danny? All right, very good. Um, last year, Dave Stephan mentioned a, a pest to us that um, we've had a big problem with here in, in Pitt County. And I asked the question uh, in the chat if anybody else has seen it. I didn't get any responses. So I thought I would try again when I had an opportunity to have the mic. So um, what you're seeing here uh, is damage to Japanese cedars, Cryptomeria japonica, where you have individual dead branches or thinning branches. And I just wanted to ask the group if you'll indicate by a green check or a red check, and if Lee J will help me with this, um, indicate whether you've seen this before on Japanese cedars. And again, this would be up starting near the top um, portion of the plant, extending down the trunk, usually entire branches that are dying back. OK, very good. It looks like we had had some people who have seen it. and. 
some people who didn't, a bunch of people who didn't respond. And um, this is um, an emergent hole. And what this is is um, it's cypress weevil, which has uh, become a common pest in our area in Pitt County on Japanese cedar, uh, Cryptomeria japonica. And again, Dave mentioned this last year. Um, the the adult is a large weevil. And I'll go to my next slide here. Um, that is the adult's probably three quarters of an inch in length, as is the, the grub of the larva there. And um, they, they actually, the adults will overwinter in the leaf litter below the plant, um, not in a reproductive stage at that point, but just but just hanging on over wintering there. Uh, and then in warm weather as it comes in the spring, they go out to the foliage and they begin to feed on this foliage using their rasping mouth part to feed on that. Um, and then during the year as they become reproductive, they lay eggs. And, and I'll go back here. They lay them at the um, usually near where branches emerge from the trunk. That larva develops in there tunnels and bores around uh, and ends up girdling that branch. Um, and sometimes there's enough damage that it kills out the entire top portion of a plant, the main stem as well. But as you can see, it's very large um, weevil, very large larva, does a lot of damage. And we've, in Pitt County, had many, many plantings of Japanese cedars um, damaged by these. I'll also just refer. Um, here quickly, um, the information um, that that I've got on this came from uh, Steve Van Vera's uh, fact sheet that we have online on cypress weevil. Uh, I think it was originally uh, in North Carolina. The two original reports were um, our specimens were in 1928 uh, from Phelps Lake and 1953 from White Lake. Um, I know we've seen them most prominently in Pitt County. Um, in 1999, uh, following a number of years, 99, 2000, following a number of years, 99, 96 to 99 of uh, major tropical storms and hurricanes. Um, so there's a lot of damage to plants to build up the populations of these. And then also, uh, we've seen it recently in drought years where we've had that problem. And someone has their um, hand raised. Carrie. Uh, Carrie says, have we seen damage in any other plant species? Um, Dave had mentioned in the past, or either Steve or someone had mentioned that um, that Leyland cypress, I believe, as well. Um, in fact, here in the fact sheet I'm looking at says that in 2004 in Winston-Salem um, they had been. So got another hand raised. So um, this is, um, yes, definitely not a good thing. I haven't seen them in Leyland Cypress here uh, in Pitt County. We've seen some other um, borers in those last year that David had shown on this uh, presentation as well. But we've seen a lot of these in, in the Japanese cedar. I just want to make sure people are aware of it. If you start seeing um, major branches dying back, then um, go ahead and look a little closer. As you can see uh, from my pictures here, when you've got them and they're very active, um, the damage is very easy to find. So I think that's all I have unless there's another question. David. OK, uh, Dan, uh, this is Dave Stephan. Um, this is, I uh, just want to add a couple things. This is a native species of weevil. This is not something that got introduced to the U.S. And its known natural host is bald cypress, uh, Taxodium. Um, but the weevil is also known from as far in the northeast as uh, southern New York State, probably the Long Island area. And since bald cypress doesn't occur any farther north than the Dismal Swamp region of Virginia, uh, it must be in some other host as well. And I'm just guessing, and I have no information on this, but Atlantic white cedar would seem to be the other likely possible host for it. 
We do have one or two records of it in Leyland Cypress, as you mentioned, but far and away the most numerous records of this thing are from the Japanese cedar. Thanks, Dave, and, and thank you, Danny. At this point, it's my pleasure to introduce Brian Jackson. Brian is a native of, of North Carolina. He got a, his bachelor's degree from the horticulture department at NC State and then went on to get a master's at Auburn and his PhD from Virginia Tech. He's been on the, back on the faculty here at NC State in the hort department for three and a half years, and he teaches five courses on, on plant ID. Five courses, four of them are on, on plant ID. He's taught plant ID at, at each of those other institutions, so he's the perfect person to be here talking with us today about plant identification. Brian? Hey, good morning, Lucy. Good morning, everyone else. Thank you for, for this opportunity. This is really exciting. Uh, one quick note, uh, Dave, just to mention what you had said about the, the beetle. I have actually observed uh, the Atlantic white cedar, Chemociprus bioides, with similar symptoms as to what Danny was showing with the cryptomeria, so that may indeed, your observation may be, may be correct. Um, but, but today, what I, I want to spend a few minutes on is, as Lucy asked me to share with you some, some of my hints and tips for uh, one of what I consider to be the most important aspects as what we as, as horticulturalists and as extension agents deal with, and also one of the most frustrating, and that is plant identification. Uh, if I can only imagine how much time each of you spend uh, we're dealing with the public's questions about what is this and what is this. And uh, so what I'm going to do is, is, is assume that you have a basic knowledge of, of general leaf arrangements and some general principles. Uh, we've uh, we've all been taught uh, probably in similar fashion, but what I want to do is kind of point out some of the things that I have learned in, in the process of learning to identify plants myself as well as teaching students um, at, at different levels of, of education uh, how to identify plants. Um, so one of, the, uh, uh, one of the first things I would start by, by saying is, is most times you're either given a photo um, taken with a cell phone that is very blurry, or you are given a leaf or a little twig that's been in a Ziploc bag in the trunk of someone's car for three days, and then they give it to you and it's a pile of muck or it's a, a crumbled up piece of leaf, and they say, what is this? And, and that's when this, this challenge of identifying plants as agents and as master gardeners becomes a daunting task. Um, so with that in mind, one of the things I, I uh, have to to relay is the detail of buds and really some of the really small features of, of our woody plants particularly that can, that can aid us in identifying it. But hopefully um, your constituents are sending you much better samples than what I'm showing you here, which, which I have received uh, more often than not. Um, so, so let me start here uh, and, and ask you to, to bear with me and think for a moment um, about all the individuals who you know in your life. How many people do you know, family, friends, constituents? constituents, movie stars, actors, politicians, how many people do you know by name when you see their face? And I'm willing to bet that each of you could easily think of 500, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people who you could recognize their, their face and put a name first and last with, that, that with their face. And, and I, I encourage everyone to think that way about identifying plants because it's the exact same thing. We're looking for the, the same principles, the same features for identifying plants. And, and this, this individual here. Of course, you know, all plants don't have name tags, so we have to figure out ways of, of separating these plants. So as we, as we go through, I say it's as easy as um, the same things that we do when, when looking at new people, when we meet new people, I'm looking at their face, I'm seeing how, high, how tall they are, their overall weight, their, their hair color, their skin color, their eye color, do they have a freckle or a growth mark or, or earrings in their ear, any other distinguishing marks. And as I'm, I'm, I'm evaluating them, I'm, I'm saying their name over and over, hello Mark or hello Susie, how are you? And these features are, 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 are connecting in my brain to this name. This is the same principle that I try to encourage my students to think about when identifying plants. So let's go to a few of these characteristics. I like to, to think about um, don't get bogged down with, with overall general generalities of things that you see a lot. In other words, 
opposite leaves. Well, there's a lot of things with opposite leaves. Instead, let's try to, to train ourselves and to train other gardeners and horticulturalists and plant enthusiasts, let's train them to look for the odd and the unusual. So I'm always talking about to my students, what is the 11th finger? What is it that this particular specimen or this sample or this plant has that I can always look for that and never get it wrong again? All right, so we're always talking about the 11th finger. Now, obviously for trees don't have faces. I wish they did. It'd make it so much easier. But going back to the concept of, of learning new people and new names, how do you start? Writing and repeating. Um, I started this practice about two semesters ago with my students as kind of a, a pedagogical experiment, if you will. And, and actually, I require my students to write uh, the plants on each of the plant lists each week prior to lab. And, and I encourage also master gardeners and other folks that I've talked to, to to treat the certified plant professional exam, the plant list, the same way. If you'll just take some time, a few minutes a day or a few times a week, and just begin writing some of these plant names, and as you write them, repeat them out loud and practice proactive, active learning by, by pronouncing it and writing it. You're hearing it, you're seeing it, and you're actually doing it. So, so those names, those very difficult names, often become more familiar as you take a chance to write them down and repeating them out loud so that you can actually hear yourself saying it. So, so the, the most difficult challenge that I find that students have is, is, is recognizing the plant is, is pretty easy, but then taking the name and putting the two together is the barrier that is so often the most difficult to cross. So I always start with, all right, let's get familiar with our names, get familiar with the names, and then let's get familiar with what the plants look like. And then the process of pulling them together should be a whole lot easier. So uh, breaking down the list. Now, in the list, I, I, I decided just as a point of reference for a document that most or all are familiar with is the Certified Plant profes Professional uh, plant list. Uh, the most recent copy was revised in 2008. So um, I'm going to make a couple of references to this list uh, just as, 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 an, as, as an example. All right? so, so I break down any large group of plants into a smaller list into manageable pieces. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, well, when you look at a specimen or if you look at a plant in, in the landscape, we'll start. Is it deciduous? Is it evergreen? Is it a gymnosperm or is it, is it an angiosperm, broad-leafed or needle-like? And when you do that, you immediately separate and pull apart a lot of the plants that it could be, and you start to break it down into a more manageable group. And I'll give you an example of that in just a moment. Um, now this is something, the, the, next, the next section here, when unsure of something, um, when I'm sure what something is, try this. Um, I encourage you to ask yourself, you know, what is this not? If you're looking at a, at a specimen, what is it not, as opposed to what is it? Because if you ask yourself, what is it not, then you can kind of narrow out, or, or you can get rid of all those other possibilities. Is it an evergreen? Is it a gymnosperm? Is it a holly? Is it a, a pine? You get rid of all those things, and then you start, start narrowing that list. And, and it, 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 it makes it much easier to begin hopefully figuring out, oh, well, this is a spirea, and then from that point, breaking down what individual species it is. Inspector Gadget, my favorite cartoon as a kid. I watched it every morning before school growing up. And I use every tool possible in, in my power of observation in, in trying to figure out what is that 11th finger of the specimen I'm looking at that's going to allow me to figure out what specimen it is or what, what genus it is, even for that matter. All right, breaking it down. So this is the example I told you about. I, I just took a few minutes for the certified uh, plant list, and I, I, I counted 189 plants. Now that takes us through the woodies all the way through the vines. I did not include bulbs or any of the herbaceous material or weeds, uh, but 189 plants. So let's think, think about this. Smaller groups. Of those 189, we had 55 evergreens. And I, I assume that even the most novice of, of homeowners, and certainly with the education of master gardeners, uh, these, these, these categories are pretty broad. So everyone has an understanding of evergreen. So 29% of the list is evergreen. Uh, 31 are conifers. So that's only 16% of that massive list or anything that's, that's conifer-like or gymnosperms. 18 are hollies, only 9.5%. And then we've got 14 are compound leaf plants. And uh, a quick review of, of a simple leaf uh, versus a compound leaf. Uh, compound leaf, of course, being in anything like a pecan, uh, walnut, allanthus, the tree of heaven, 
Cladrastis, the yellow wood, any number of, of species with those compound leaf uh, plants. Um, of those, I broke it down even further. Again, small, manageable pieces. Um, of those, eight of the 14 had pinnately compound leaves. Three were trifoliate. And, and three of those compound leaf plants were evergreen. Mahonia, I think, was one of those as an example. And then I've got six grasses and grass-like plants making up or, or comprising only 3% of the, of the CPP list of 189 plants. So when I approach my students in this way, I, I, I seemingly get positive feedback from them because they feel like up front that this is a more manageable task and that they're more easily able to, to tackle it, as opposed to thinking, oh my goodness, it's, it's, it, it could be one of hundreds or one of thousands. If you break it down smaller, it has positive reinforcement and it's easier for someone to tackle this object. So that's this, this kind of my, my approach to, uh, to, for my students at least, so I hope to um, maybe give that as an option to you as well. I love taking, you know, uh, 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 photos of my students as they as they try and work this and decipher it and these these two photos are showing um, they are playing detective. I am training detectives um, every day in that looking for those eleventh fingers in, in the plants. So so the basic ID features leaf arrangement we're we're all familiar with opposite and alternate and world or the world being three or more leaves per node such as the nerium oleander. Uh, if you see that of course that's very very unique and unusual uh, leaf type. Uh, that goes back to the example I gave you of only 14 plants of the 189 on the CPP list have compound leaves as opposed to simple leaves. So that, that's a good thing is, is making sure you're aware of what is a simple versus a compound leaf. And again, how do you determine that? Well, you look for the bud. And the, the bud will always tell you what is the leaf. So anything beyond the bud is the leaf. Uh, leaf shape and margins. were. We're pretty familiar, and we also know that when we open up the, the DER manual that there's 18 pages of leaf shapes and margins, and it's daunting, and, and it's very confusing. Well, I only try to look for the ones that are most unusual, most specific, and I'll give you a couple of examples of that. Flower season and type. Um, now, this is one that I caution you on because I get a lot of phone calls from people, and I also have a lot of students in my courses who, who try to associate the identification of certain landscape plants based upon what flower season or what season of the year it's flowering in. Well, we all know that this is a perfect example of a winter that you cannot count on something blooming on the 15th of March because it's already been in bloom three or four weeks. So uh, I caution against flower season, even though you can broadly say spring or summer or winter, uh, but as far as individual months that often people like to do, then that's very, very difficult, uh, especially with our warm, with our warm winters. Finding the hidden clues. Um, one thing that, that I encourage you to do if, if you have the opportunity of actually seeing a plant in the landscape and you have full access to the whole plant, uh, make sure to look for the, the most mature foliage on that plant, which is usually going to be on the outside most exposed to the sun uh, part of the plant. This is going to be the part of the, the leaves or the, the part of the plant that's most representative of, it, of the true identification features. Uh, the more in the shade you get or the more juvenile the foliage, uh, the leaf shapes and sizes and, and margins can be very, very different. So, so always try to look for and to obtain samples of the most mature leaves uh, or buds and flowers on, on a specimen. Uh, I, I encourage people to get at least five, if not maybe ten, leaves or samples from a plant, whether that's breaking them off or whether that's just walking around the specimen and looking at five to ten different twigs. And then from those, make an assessment of what is the most common, what is the most popular uh, features that you are seeing. What is the majority? Start with the basics. Uh, leaf arrangement is, it is very key. Um, it's, I, I make sure that, as from a teaching standpoint, that my students always remember that the first thing they look for is opposite versus alternate. And, and thinking about this time of the year, it's very important in that all the spireas, are, for example, alternate, whereas the viburnums are always going to be opposite, and our dutsias are going to be opposite, and dutsias and spireas look very similar. Uh, so just by looking at the leaf arrangement, we can immediately say that this is not a spirea or that this is a dutsia. So, so leaf arrangement is certainly very key. And look for the odd and unusual, and I'm going to show you um, pretty, pretty quickly what some of the odd and unusual features are that, that I look for. 
uh, with plants. Uh, one example um, I want to show you about the importance of looking at old mature foliage on the outside of the plants. And by the way, if anyone has any questions, please feel free either um, um, now or at the end. I will end about at least six to eight minutes early if you have questions, but, but please feel free to ask questions. Um, looking, at this, at looking at this slide, the, the proximal leaf is, is the leaf that's taken closer to the stem of a plant and on the exact same branch, mind you. And the reason this one is larger is because it's in more shade. All right? You get closer to the outside of the plant, and here you've got more sun. Therefore, the, the leaf is smaller, has deeper lobes, uh, which is actually allowing sunlight to penetrate deeper into the canopy for photosynthesis uh, efficiency. So, so that's why you always go to the mature, because in, in a reference book, if you're picking up a, a key or the Dura manual or any other guide, they're going to give you characteristics based upon the mature foliage, not the immature foliage that may be shaded. Okay? So always make sure to look for the mature foliage. Uh, leaf scars. Now this is one that um, uh, for, for winter ID, or naked ID as I like to refer to it in the fall, uh, is very important. Now a lot of leaf scars, a lot of plants with leaf scars look very, very similar, but some are really quite unique. All right, take this plant, for example, Phalodendron amaranth. Now this one's not on the CPP list. This is one that uh, is, is rarely un fairly uncommon, but a very unique specimen in the landscape. And, and look at the buds. All right, a very distinct shape. Uh, very few plants have I ever encountered have this shape. Now, you think about it, there's nothing else it looks like than a toilet bowl lid, as crazy as that may be, but never will you ever forget this if you look at the toilet bowl lid. You could say a horseshoe, but that's not as fun as a toilet bowl lid. Another example, Fraxinus. We have, we have several species of ashes in our landscapes. Um, two of the most common are Fraxinus americanum and Fraxinus pennsylvanica, the white ash and the green ash. Uh, if you look at these two plants vegetatively or even in flower, they are very, very similar uh, with only minute differences in their leaflet shape and number and also in, in the size and shape of their samara, but if you, the, the fruit of the, the, of the ash. But if you, if you look, uh, leaf scars, uh, the scar left behind after the leaf is upsized in the fall is very distinct because here, if you look at this example, uh, on, on the top left, you've got Fraxinus americana with this U-shaped or this slightly curved leaf scar. Another example here at the bottom, there's the leaf scar, right? Rounded, a U-shaped. What I like to say is if you look at the size of that, it's the smiling American. Smiling American. You flip over to Fraxinus pennsylvanica and look at the leaf scar. It is completely flat. No smile whatsoever at the top. So the green ash has no smile, the white ash has a smile. Something very simple, but for me, it always allows me to identify the, the, the ashes. And then lastly, another example of a plant with, with very prominent leaf scars. Uh, even in its winter state, a lot of plants are more easy to identify. This is Edgeworthia, as, as you may know certainly from looking at it with those beautiful flowers, but the leaf scars are so prominently raised off the margin, very, very distinct. Buds, uh, there are entire books published on, on, on identifying winter plants or woody plants in the, in the winter landscape, and a lot of that is focusing on buds. A few very general characteristics. Uh, this is the duckbill-shaped bud of, of, Lyria, of uh, Liriodendron, uh, the yellow poplar, a tulip poplar. Um, very distinct, looks to me like a duckbill. Let's look at a few other very distinct ones. If you see a bud like this, you can pretty much count on magnolia something. Uh, very few times will you, you be led astray if you see a bud like this in the winter landscape that's not in magnolia. Very, very hairy. Uh, these these called pseudoterminal. Um, if you see this, likely you're thinking of one genus, and that would be Asculus. All of our buckeyes, uh, many native buckeyes, uh, buck, uh, Asculus parviflor, Asculus pavia being two of the more common ones, and they all have this kind of pseudoterminal bud where the terminal bud has actually died or, or fallen away in this example, and then the, the bud to the side will take the shape or take the, uh, the position of the terminal bud for the following year. Very distinct terminal bud arrangement with pseudoterminal buds. Hidden buds, a couple of examples. You know, look closely and, and remember, how do you determine a, a leaf is simple or compound? Well, you look to see where the bud is. And if you can't find the bud, well, that may be an even better clue. A lot of plants will completely hide their buds under a, a large swollen petiole. All right, a couple of examples of that, uh, certainly Platinus occidentalis, the sycamore. Where are the buds? Uh, you can't see them. You have to actually break the leaf off and the bud is beneath. 
All right, a couple of other, we'll go back for one second, a couple of other examples, Sephora, Japonica. Um, the the uh, Sephora is, is um, Japanese pagoda tree, uh, Cladrasis kentuckia, the yellow wood, uh, another plant that, that hides its buds completely, a very unique feature. Plant sap, um, I like to give example of maples. Maples are a very large group of, of plants. If you, if you take the chance to look and you can get it to the genus Acer, um, we'll take, take a leaf and just break the leaf off. And if you see sap em emerging from the petiole of, of a maple leaf, it's got to be one of two species, Acer compestre, the hedge maple, or Acer platinoides, the Norway maple. Those are the only two uh, maples that are going to exude a white milky sap. So in that, that regards, that helps with a very large group of, of the maples. Um, getting away from buds and, and sap, getting into some stem features. Uh, look for some plants that have this odd spur type branching. And a spur branch is basically a shortened lateral branch that has very shortened internodes. And then from this short lateral branch, you will have all of the leaves and or flowers emerging. And it's very difficult sometimes to decipher what the leaf arrangement is on plants that have spur branches because the internodes are so shortened that really the leaves look whirled. But just by virtue of them having these, these spur branches are very, very noticeable. Ginkgo is an excellent example of a plant that has the spur branches. Um, Pseudolaryx amabilis, the golden larch, is one that has the spur branches. Uh, another example would be crab apple, or even just apple species. Malus will have these spur branches. Very unique. But ginkgo, middle of the winter time, should not be a problem just by looking at the spur branches. Oh, green stems. Uh, this is pretty prevalent, but yet very, very obvious, very noticeable. If you take a chance to look at the stem, uh, Caria japonica. Uh, is, is one here on the left in the middle of the winter, the Japanese rose, uh, very distinguishable green stems. Akuba japonica, most people do not have trouble with identifying Akuba, uh, but nonetheless, it, it too has these bright green stems. Uh, Prunus mumei, uh, this is one that uh, is a little tricky for students, or, or for anyone in that matter, uh, who learns it when it's flowering in, in January, February, March, and then once the leaves appear, it's, it's like a completely different plant. Uh, we'll take a chance to look, one, for fruit right about now. I, I just walked through the brickyard here on campus this morning and saw many, many fruit on the ground. And then also for the very yellow, or, I'm sorry, very green twigs. Uh, a couple of other examples here, Acer nagundo, uh, one of the few maples that will have very bright, bright green stems, especially on the, on the newest two to three years of growth. Jasminum nudiflorum, the jasmine, is another plant that has, has green stems as well. So look for stem color. Square stems. Uh, here's an example again of, of uh, Jasminum nudiflorum, the, the, the uh, jasmine I just told you about with the green stems. Uh, stems that are squared, and often that is a result of the leaf, all right, this decurrent leaf base where the leaf tissue kind of extends down the twig a little bit, and it kind of gives that ridged look. But boxwoods, uh, the taxis, the ewes, jasminum, plants in the, you can't really see that very well, plants in the mint family, lemiaceae, all of our salvias. Uh, for example, think of coleus, those really distinct square stems. Uh, another example of uh, Lamiaceae, this is actually a, a hen bit, it's a, a weed that you all have seen in your, in your yards, I'm sure. Square stems, here's rosemary with a square stem, uh, all in the Lamiaceae family. So you can begin associating these plants together in, in like families. Uh, stem thickness, so, and here's a little trick that I learned when I was in graduate school at Virginia Tech. In the middle of the winter, I was walking to, to, the, to the dining hall one day, and I passed a row of all ch flowering cherries. And I noticed that one of them was completely different than all the rest. And I didn't know why, so I stood and I stared at it for a while. And then I looked, and all of these cherries were Yoshino, except for one, which was the Kwanzaa. Okay? And what I noticed was is that the twigs, in the dead of winter, the twigs on the Yoshino cherry, which is located here at the top, are very, very, very small. The, the twig diameter at the very tip of the branches is about the diameter and size of a toothpick. Okay? Maybe a Q-tip. Okay, very, very small. Now, what I noticed different about this one tree in this line of cherries was the, the uh, Kwanzaa cherry, it, the end of 
its twigs are very, very thick, very girthy, and they remind me like those thick kindergarten pencils that we all used to use in school. I personally admittedly still use them in my office. I love those thick pencils. So I, I began associating a winter identification feature of Kwanzaa cherry as the fat kindergarten pencils, and the Yoshino cherry as having Q-tip shaped or Q-tip sized twigs. Something small, but it, it, it kind of shows through. So take a look at your cherries and, uh, and look. Now in the, in the summertime, of course, you've got glands on the leaves in different positions, which will help you. I'll mention glands in just a second. Hair or nair, I like to say. This, these are two specimens uh, of, this is Typhena uh, lacionata, and this uh, a Rus Typhena lacionata, and this is Rus Typhena. Uh, two spe two uh, different species of, of sumac, which look, all practical purposes, identical, except one has, has the velvety uh, pubescence on the stems, and one has not. All right? So whether the stems are hairy or whether they're not, these things are all those 11th fingers that I was talking about, something very, very different. Uh, going on through just a few more here before I, I stop for questions. Uh, wings, of course, you, you've seen these wings. They're called alate, A-L-A-T-E, for those of you who may have heard that term before. Um, but this is a corky outgrowth, often seen on the stem, and sometimes even on the petiole or the rachis of some compound leaf plants, like with sumacs. Uh, but a few examples, almost the late of the wing down, uh, young specimens of sweet gum, liquidambar, uh, Corcus macrocarpa, wonderful, wonderful oak with the, with the large bur oak here. Uh, Euonymus elatus, everyone knows Euonymus and, and, and its wing stems. Uh, glands, I told you I'd mention glands again. Uh, glands on the, on the cherries are something you can always count for, hence the pruna species I've got here, which always represent glands in some shape or fashion. Uh, Viburnum opulus roseum, the, the very popular snowball bush, this is a leaf depicted here in the photo. It's the only viburnum, uh, at least on the, on, the list, on the CPP list as well as what I teach, it's the only one that has these, these wart-like glands on the petiole. All other viburnums, be them deciduous or evergreen, uh, of, of the most common viburnums, I should say, do not have this. So look for the maple-like leaves and the warts, and you just separated uh, viburnum opulus roseum, the snowball bush. Uh, Alanthus altissima, if you've ever touched this weed, and why do I teach this? Well, I, I often have to defend teaching some weeds, if you will, and, and that's so that student and the up-and-coming folks in our industry can know what the plants are in the landscape that need to be removed, uh, just as it's important to know the great ones that need to be planted. But uh, Alanthus, if you ever touched it, you immediately have this very strong smell, and that comes from glands. Speaking of smell, use your sniffer. Some of you recognize this old, old uh, colleague of mine. Um, uh, Stu Warren, as he smells the, uh, oh, I went too far, excuse me. Stu Warren was smelling the, the, the Bradford pear, of course. Uh, looking at Alanthus altissima, I just mentioned this tree of heaven. If you ever touched the leaf, uh, especially the young growing leaves, it smells just like peanut butter. All right, give it a try, um, and, and that is a, a, a fragrance that's being emitted from the glands beneath each of these leaflets. And the glands are these little tiny dots, if you can see here on this photo, all right? So anytime something smells. Uh, something a little different here, stipules. Um, a, little, a little botany lesson for us all to remember is that a, a leaf is technically comprised of three uh, morphological features or three anatomical parts. That's the blade, of course, which is the broad expanded leaf. Uh, part of the leaf that is mostly photosynthetic, and then the second part of the leaf, which we're familiar with, is the petiole, which is the stem uh, of a leaf, and then the third official part of the leaf is this leaf-like appendage uh, that is often falls off from the leaf as soon as it emerges from the from the bud. But this is the stipule, and these stipules are deciduous uh, within a few days, if not weeks, of most deciduous plants, uh, but in this example of Shinomelies or Kinomelies, if you prefer the quince, uh, these stipules tend to stay, stay around for a long time, uh, something very recognizable um, that, that you can look for. A few other general features, bark, fruit, branch patterns. Um, bark, we know there are many plants with ornamental features, ornamental bark. Um, fruit, um, whether that be or good fruit or bad fruit, branching patterns are very distinct. I always try to separate uh, the green giant arborvitae versus the oriental arborvitae, Platycladus orientalis versus the Euplicata green giant, simply by looking at their branching patterns. And that's something that I found to be about the best feature for that. Uh, in about a minute or so in left, I'm going to stop this uh, just to review briefly the gymnosperm leaf types. 
Um, and so if you can recognize that a plant in the landscape is actually a gymnosperm, well, look what type foliage does it have. If the foliage is, 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 is soft to touch and the, and the leaves are like scales on a fish, you could, this is what's referred to as the mature scale-like foliage of gymnosperms. And here's an up-close version. And each of these scales is actually a leaf on this gymnosperm branch. The next one is, is the sharp juvenile foliage, often referred to as all shaped, A-W-L, and that's the little prickly, uh, more juvenile foliage. You'll often see all shaped and scale shaped foliage on the same plant. Linear leaves, I, I often refer to something like, like this taxis, this U, as having a linear foliage where it's not quite the all shaped, but it's not long like a needle. And then, of course, the last is the needles or the fascicles that we'll see with our pines. So that may help with that. Uh, thinking of your, your gymnosperms, look for the markings on the back, these white stomatal glands that emit this white wax, this glaucous wax coloration, are often in different shapes. For example, all the chemicipers pacifera have bow ties. You look at the little bow ties or dog bones, if you will, but I, I, I seem to uh, think that they're dressing up for a special occasion, so they've got their bow ties on, whereas the chemicipers obtusa, the Hinoki cypress, are all X's and Y's. So why chemicipers pacifera are going to a nice upscale party, chemicipers obtusa are home doing their alphabet. All right. Um, hollies, really, and, and I will, I think, uh, about end it here. Hollies, what I, what I would suggest that you do is, is actually, if you're if you're in a situation where you can collect a leaf or a sample of different hollies, when you guys, when you get plants of similar features together, that is when it's really clear the differences that each of them have from each other. So when you can get them together, you look at this and you can and you can see whether it be luster leaf, whether it be Emily Bruner, whether it be Burford, Dwarf Burford, whether it be Carissa or Alex Pedunculosa or Savannah or on and on and on. When they're when they're together, the differences really stand out. Uh, Berbera Daisy has yellow bark on the inside, so look at your Mahonias and Barberries and, and see look at that yellow bark on the inside. Dogwoods, as you may or may not know, opposite foliage always, but they have that wonderful little magic trick that kids love. I say kids, I love it myself. Students love it too. They have the threads in their veins. All cornacea, you do this, something very distinct to look for. Where to look for help? Well, stick your head in and look. Sometimes it doesn't hurt. Guys, there are apps all on your phones. You may already have apps on your computers. You take your phones with you. LeafSnap is a very popular one. Uh, a lot of stuff. Uh, don't rely on cookies because they, they cannot help you very much. But with that, I will happily take any questions in the time I have left, Lucy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. Any questions for Brian? Yes, this, sounds like this, this sounds like my class. Please. It's quiet. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, this is Gina Myers. I just mentioned to them the app that you just mentioned. Did you yes. call it Leaf App? It was Leaf Snap. I, I, I just took the uh, slide back. Here it is on the screen. Leaf Snap. Uh, Flora Folio, I'm not sure. Uh, this, this is, is my, phone. my phone. I've, I've just never, never used this app. Plant DB, DB is pretty, pretty good. good. There may be others. Yeah, this is. These are the leaf snap. It, it works on on common native plants. Um, this one is 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 basically just a dictionary of plants. Uh, this this on this side is, is actually pretty good, um, but yeah, I would just go to your whether it be iTunes or whatever app store that you you have for your smartphone and just type in plant plant ID gardening and any of those keywords should bring you up to whatever apps are available. Um, in talking to some other colleagues of mine at other universities, there is a lot of work being done to actually develop new and, and improved apps for smartphones and iPads because in education we, we know that this is the direction that it's going and we can, we can touch the largest market of students and professionals who want to learn more by, by having these apps. So there's more to come, I'm sure. Brian, you have a question in the chat. Oh, okay. Does night blooming cirrus get the wings that you referred to? Cirrus get the wings that you referred to. 
Um, night blooming cirrus, get the wings. That, I'm not sure what is meant by the cirrus, although that's something I'm not familiar with. Um, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure about uh, the C E R E U S. Either that's a genus I'm not familiar with. Does anyone know, or am I just missing something? And that could very well be the case. Talking about a cacti. Yes. Oh, okay. I do not know. I'm. I'm not familiar. Sorry, I couldn't help. <laughs> Any other questions for Brian? Okay, well, Brian, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you being here and sharing all of those strategies and tips. Oh, you're super welcome, and uh, if anyone ever has any questions, please let me know. In the meantime, I have about 40 students who are studying plant samples out in the lab, so I, I, m I must return. Thank you so much, Lucy. Everyone have a great day. Yeah, just so you don't miss it, there's a note in the chat that says, excellent talk. Oh, super. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leanna. This was really great. I want to take your class. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. More the merrier. You're all welcome. Anytime. Okay. Next up, we have showstoppers. And Mark Blevins, are, are you going to do showstoppers today? I see that Mark has his microphone on and he's typing in the chat. So let's give him a second. Oh, hey, how about now? Hey, we hear you loud and clear. Great. Hey, okay, I've been talking, but <laughs> hey, great. Uh, I'm just a cookie myself, but these are showstopper plants nominated by North Carolina nursery men and women, selected by extension agents, and premiered at the finest of home and garden shows across our state. These plants can steal the show in just about any garden. Five showstopper plants are chosen each year, and one is highlighted at each of these wonderful webinars. This time it's Chinese French tree. So I've got a knock knock joke for you. Knock knock. Who's there? Oh, Key. Well, key who? Key who? Oh, key and Nanthus retusus. That's who. Oh, slide. It's tough as nails and a consistent bloomer. Oh, you can give us the next slide there, Lucy. I'm tied up. Oh, thanks. It's tough as nails and a consistent bloomer. Put it in part shade for great leathery, lustrous foliage to full sun for amazing blooms. Next slide. Chinese fringe is typically a multi-stemmed large shrub, but it can be a single stem specimen. Next slide. The flowers show up on the tip of new shoots to maybe make an even bigger floral impact than our native fringe tree. Check out this showstopper plant and others at your local nursery. I'm Mark Blevins. Thanks for picking showstopper plants. Thank you, Mark. You got a, a, a vote from someone who has one and loves it. Yay. Thanks, Lucy. OK. Let's move right along in, into our um, current insects of interest. David Steffen from the, the Department of Entomology and the Plant Disease and Insect Clinic. Dave, welcome. Good morning. Um, as usual, I'm technologically challenged here, and Mike is helping me get all set up so I can find things. All right, I guess that's the, uh, there we go. OK, uh, so we're going to talk about insects for the next half hour or so. And the uh, topic that is on everybody's minds these days is not the political debates. It's not the latest winner of the reality, whatever reality show is on TV. It's, and we're, we're not moving. Whoops, OK, uh, next. Uh-oh, we skipped uh, a bunch of slides here. All right, so I'm going to have to back up here a moment. That thing's not working very well. OK, well, uh, no, this is we're having a problem here.
Now, for some reason, the uh, the slides are coming up very delayed after I click on them. Uh, but the the beam plataspid, also known as the kudzu bug, has been showing up in the past month, and uh, it's been out there in enormous numbers. And uh, people are finding it on all kinds of plants. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, in, in huge numbers, and they've never seen this thing before, and really it's just been spread into North Carolina in just the last couple of years. Uh, here are some specimens that are on an American elderberry in uh, Polk County, photographed last March. This critter is in a species in the family Plataspididae, which is sometimes commonly misspelled as the Plataspidae. And this is a family of uh, true bugs that uh, occurs naturally in the Eastern Hemisphere, Asia, Africa, Europe. Uh, not, they do not occur naturally in the Western Hemisphere. The uh, bean platastid is the first introduction of any species of platastid to the Western Hemisphere. Uh, the natural range of this particular species is in southeastern Asia from India to Japan. And the Plataspididae is a family that belongs to the superfamily Pentatomoidea, which includes our familiar stink bugs, the shield bugs, and a couple of other families of bugs that are indigenous to the United States. Uh, this map shows, this is borrowed from a, uh, a meeting that was held a couple of months ago in Missouri, shows the known distribution of the bean platespid so far. It was first detected here in uh, northeastern Georgia back in fall of 2009 in, in a number of counties. Uh, surveys were started the following year. And then in this green area, which includes parts of South Carolina, one county here in North Carolina, and neighboring Alabama. And then the last year, as you can see, the known distribution just exploded enormously, especially to the east. Now, these things are actually good flyers, although they certainly don't look like they should be capable of flying. And, uh, but they are probably following the prevailing winds, uh, and so they're spreading farther to the east and northeast than they are in other directions. I'm sure this is not for lack of sampling in these areas. It's probably just you don't get prevailing winds coming from, these direct from the directions which would push them into Tennessee and farther into Alabama than you do to South Carolina and North Carolina. Uh, already so far this spring, we've gotten records from a few counties that are outside of the, the previously known distributions thing. And I'm sure if it isn't throughout all of North Carolina already, it will be by the end of this year. Uh, we are getting these things on, I say, a number of host plants, some of which had not previously been reported before. The bean platastid hibernates as an adult, and then when it emerges in the spring, it's out there before its natural legume hosts, or uh, breeding hosts, are available. So it seems to feed on a very wide range of plants. In, uh, in its native habitat in Southeast Asia, the primary breeding host for this species seems to be kudzu. But it will also breed on some other legumes, such as soybeans. And there are several additional genera of cultivated beans in Asia that can serve as potential hosts. But because like I say, kudzu seems to be the preferred host. Uh, additional legume hosts that have not previously been reported to the adults that we've gotten so far this spring here in North Carolina include black locust, red bud, and wisteria. Whether it can breed on woody plants like this, if there are legumes, we don't yet know. This is a photograph of, uh, you can see they look like ticks crowded on some poor animal here. I've seen pictures of uh, brown dog tick on dogs that look like this. But this is a trifoliate orange, which is actually a plant in the citrus family. It's grown as an ornamental here in North Carolina. Um, some of the non-legume hosts that have been reported in North Carolina so far, the adults feed on include American elderberry, common fig, loquat, and the trifoliate orange. There are a few records in the literature of the uh, successful breeding of the bean platastid on non-legume plants. But they are not as uh, successful on these plants. They grow more slowly. They don't breed. Uh, they don't produce as many offspring. Uh, so most non-legume records are probably just incidental feeding by the adults. Some of the uh, non-legume hosts that have been reported in the literature uh, for the maple test would include citrus, cotton, potato, privet, rice, sugarcane, sweet potato, wheat, white mulberry, and some additional non-cultivated plants. 
Uh, this another photograph. This is from Brunswick County. They are on common fig. Now there are no natural enemies of the bean plutasmid here in the United States. A few of our generalist predators here, such as certain species of predaceous bugs, there are some predaceous stink bugs, uh, for example, certain species of lady beetles, certain green lacewings will feed on the nymphs of the bean plutasmid. But none of these native predators provide any real significant control. And by the way, I didn't mention these little guys are not that big. They're only about a quarter inch long, and uh, they are almost unique among any insects that I've ever seen in being virtually as wide as they are long. They're almost square in shape with kind of rounded corners when you look at them from above. There is a, an, a parasitoid wasp uh, that lays its eggs actually within the egg of the bean plutasmid. This is Paratelonemus saccharalis, which is native to Asia and so far as is known is host specific to species of Megacoptera. Uh, they're currently being studied in a lab here in the United States in quarantine for possible release in the U.S. But if this should prove to be promising, in other words, if they find there is no um, collateral with these wasps as far as attacking anything else, then there's a good chance they'll be released. Uh, of course, they're going to have some catching up to do. These, uh, these bugs have been just reproducing at phenomenal rates and uh, spreading like wildfire. There is a naturally occurring fungus called Bovaria bassiana, which has been used in uh, biological control for certain other insects. It has been found to attack the bean platyspid under uh, humid conditions, so it might offer some uh, help as well, but it's probably not going to be a major control pest. Uh, those of you down east where these things are extremely numerous, I've just been inundated with them this spring. I had one caller from Onslow County who said that the people in her community were, and I quote, freaking out over these bean plutasmids as just being on everything. Um, Say this is the first wave of them coming through, whether they will continue in these huge numbers or whether as in some other organisms that first spread through, they peak and then they drop off after a few years, this remains to be seen. Okay, this is being real sluggish and, and changing here. Here are some uh, references you can go to online to find additional reading information and pictures and things about the bean platasmid. As I said, the uh, the invasion in the U.S. here is a very rapidly evolving situation. We've only known about them here for less than three years, just about two and a half years now. And there are bound to be uh, many changes in our knowledge about the biology of this thing, you know, what host plants it feeds on, what host plants it may be capable of breeding on, uh, how it interacts with other insects in soybean communities and so forth and so on. So this is going to be an active area of study for the next few years here. But there are other insects out there to be concerned about right now at this time of year, and certainly one that's important to a lot of people are termites. Uh, termites are probably the most structurally destructive insects here in North Carolina. When I sometimes try to explain to people how serious a particular household pest is on a scale of 1 to 10, I always give subterranean termites a solid 10 because of the amount of damage they're capable of doing if they get into a structure and the expense of controlling them. Everything else, including bed bugs, is below termites in terms of their pest damage potential. Probably the most common species of subterranean termite that is termites in the genus Reticulotermes here in North Carolina getting into structural situations is going to be the eastern subterranean termite, Reticulotermes flavipes. This is the, uh, of the four species of subterranean species, uh, excuse me, subterranean termites in North Carolina, I say this is the one that's most likely to be a pest in structural wood. It can start swarming as early as February in North Carolina and then continue in April. So they're probably kind of winding down by now, especially given this early spring that we've had. Uh, of the other species of subterranean termites in uh, North Carolina swarm later in the year, Articular termites virginicus is probably starting to swarm now. It will swarm from April to June. And Reticular termites hagenii swarms in, from midsummer, say July, into late summer or early fall. There is a fourth species which has only very recently been discovered, and we know almost nothing about its biology distribution. I think it was discovered only by DNA studies. So it may be as common as some of these others, or it may be much less so. We simply don't know yet. 
This is an image that I took here on campus last summer. This shows the late summer species, Reticulotermes hagenii, swarming at the base of a large oak tree here on campus. When these guys swarm, they, they may do so by the thousands or maybe even tens of thousands. It's uh, like a tree that produces uh, hundreds of thousands of seeds in a given year. Uh, they just they're out there. And uh, the numbers are just, you know, say, it's very impressive. I've seen them swarming for any time from mid-morning to a late afternoon or early evening. Oftentimes, they will swarm just following a rain. If there had been a rainy day or earlier in the uh, day before or even earlier that day, that seems to stimulate uh, swarming by many termites. Now, it's rather difficult to capture a shot of these things swarming. You can't really see because they don't show up against the lighter background. But each one of these little dandruff-like dots in the air here, these are individual flying termites. And uh, I have seen them swarming on occasion in such numbers that looked almost like mist or smoke rising off the ground in the plant beds. And you've got to wonder just how many tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of termites are there down in the soil there to be able to produce such an enormous swarm of these termites. It kind of boggles the mind. Okay, some close-up images of uh, these termites. Now, most termites species have, you have the nymphs here, the smaller individuals, and then the larger workers, which never develop into anything else. And you have the soldiers, which uh, in the subterranean termites, they have these massive heads and these, these huge jaws. And they are, these are used in defense of the colony. Uh, a primary enemy for termites, at least here in these temperate zones, are going to be ants. The ants just love termites if they can get their jaws on them. And uh, the soldiers are necessary to defend the colony. Now, in more tropical areas, you sometimes get ant eaters that are going to be able to tear into a termite colony. And they will do some feeding, other kinds of specialized insects. There are lots of tiny little insects of various sorts and mites that live exclusively within the colonies of termites, or in some cases in ants. But that's another subject, and we won't go into that here. There are some other kinds of termite soldiers that may be various modified to spray defensive chemicals to help protect the colony. Uh, the termite swarmers, now they will shed their wings uh, shortly after they've flown. They will, they'll settle, they'll find a mate, and then they'll drop the wings because they're not going to need them for the rest of their lives. But thankfully, only a very tiny percentage, just a fraction of a percent of any of the swarmers are ever able to establish colonies. And most of those colonies die at a very young state. Um, when they're swarming, they are very vulnerable to predators. I've seen birds coming to feed on them, blue jays, mockingbirds, wrens. You'll get carpenter ants scooping them up by the mouthful. You'll get uh, uh, spiders running in there and grabbing individual termites. Uh, once the termites swarm, they don't have the protection of the soldiers anymore, and they are very vulnerable at that point. OK, so a very common question that we see is we get is, do we have ants or do we have termites? And there are three principal ways in which you can tell the difference between ants and termites. Uh, first of all, termites have the head and the thorax and the abdomen. Let me back up a slide. I can actually show it better there. <coughs> With termites, you've got the, the abdomen, you've got a thorax, and you've got the head. Again, abdomen, thorax, head. Especially between the thorax and the abdomen are rather broadly joined. It's even more obvious here on the soldier. You've got the, the head and the thorax very broadly joined together. And then the thorax and the abdomen broad. No real strong constriction between the two. Whereas on ants, you've got this really strong constriction between the head and the thorax here, and especially between the thorax and the abdomen. You've got this, what they call a wasp waist, or a petiole uh, constriction here. So that's one feature. Uh, another way is that termites, they both, both ants and termites have two pairs of wings. Termites have, this is the edge of the front wing here. And then underneath, you've got the hind wing. Termites have both the front and the hind wings virtually identical in size and in shape. Whereas in ants, here's the hind wing here, much smaller. And it's of different shape than the, than the much larger front wing. So that's another way to tell them apart. A third feature distinguishing termites from ants is that the antennae are relatively short. The segments are uniform in size and shape. And the antennae are fairly straight. Ants, and it's not real clear in this picture, but it will be in subsequent pictures, have what's called an elbowed antenna. 
The very first segment here is quite long. It's nearly as long or even longer than all the rest of the segments put together. And there's this elbow bend at the joint between the, the first segment and all the rest of the segments. So here is the uh, distinction a little more clearly. You can see the elbowed antennae here on this app. This one long segment is the very first or basal segment. And then all the rest beyond are the terminal segments. Again, here a long basal segment of the antenna, and then much longer, uh, excuse me, then much shorter individual segments beyond that with this distinct elbow at the bend. Um, so, do you have carpenter ants or do you have some other kind of ant? And carpenter ants are among our larger ants, but they are frequently mistaken for some of our familiar ants. For example, this, this ant here in the genus Formica uh, looks a lot like uh, carpenter ants, but uh, Two ways to distinguish most carpenter ants from all other kinds is that most other ant species have two nodes between the thorax and the abdomen. So here, Formica, it's got the one node, and Caponotus, just one node. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the other difference is between uh, most ant species, when you look at the thorax in profile, there are usually one or two indentations, Let's see here. Uh, or the level of the different sections of the thorax are on different planes from each other. Whereas with carpenter ants, you get the profile of the thorax. It's almost a uniformly convex curve with marked indent or marked uh, demarcation between the sections of the thorax, but no deep indentations visible in the profile. So this will help you distinguish carpenter ants from most other kind of ants. There are a few additional differences, but uh, most of them are not visible except under a microscope. Uh, OK, a little bit about carpenter ants in general. Now, at the last PPP, Mike Munster discussed scientific names, you know, how they're used, how they're formed, uh, some of the, the features of scientific names. And the genus Campanotus <coughs> excuse me, provides a, a good example of how biologists can use scientific names. Uh, large genera of plants and an animals uh, often are divided into subgenera based on the morphological differences between the groups of more closely related species within each genus. Now, uh, the genus Campanotus, which occurs virtually worldwide, has something over 900 species in the genus, so it is considered a fairly large genus of insects. Here in the U uh, US and Canada, there are seven genera of carpenter ants represented and about 50 species of them. Now, not only are there structural or morphological differences that distinguish the different subgenera of the carpenter ants, and this is what we use in our text for identifying, but there are also some behavioral and biological differences between the different subgenera as well. In North Carolina, we have about uh, five subgenera total, but three of those subgenera are represented by only one or two species, or they are not uh, structural tests in any way whatsoever. So the ones we're going to encounter, and by the way, this is how we uh, indicate subgenera in our scientific literature in parentheses. So the genus Campanotus, subgenus Campanotus, and sub and, excuse me, genus Campanotus again, subgenus Myrmitoma. Most of the ants, carpenter ants that you encounter indoors are going to be in one of these two genera. This is the black carpenter ant, which is probably the, the most destructive of the species of carpenter ants that you're liable to encounter indoors here in North Carolina. It belongs to the subgenus Campanotus, which includes two other species uh, in North Carolina. It is capable of excavating fairly sound, solid wood, but usually prefers to attack wood that has been somewhat softened by decay. Now, if you have black carpenter ants in your house, this is possibly a warning sign that you've got some uh, water damage somewhere, in other words, a leak of some kind, whether it's an internal leak from a pipe or an external leak uh, from a gutter or a roof that's causing some sort of decay in wood somewhere. Uh, this is a possible warning sign. So I often tell people when they you know, bring in black carpenter ants from home that you know, this is kind of like the canary in the coal mine. You're seeing the carpenter ants, but they're not the real problem. The real problem may be hidden somewhere. You don't know about it. However, they may also simply be foraging indoors. And I've seen this uh, in my own house. I've seen carpenter ants coming in just looking for food or looking for moisture during, during dry spells. 
Now the queen carpenter ant is quite large. This is a millimeter rule here. And she is uh, about 13, 14 millimeters long, which is a little over a half inch. And they were, she was swarming just last week. We caught her uh, actually in the hallway outside the clinic door. And uh, although they're not capable of stinging, uh, they, they do not appreciate being restrained like this one. I've got her gripped by the leg here. So she's doing her best to bite me and uh, doing a pretty good job of it, but not really hurting. Uh, fortunately, carpenter ants and uh, their genera related to them do not have stingers. However, they can spray formic acid, which is a major component of ant venom. And uh, they also have some other defensive chemicals they can spray. And just speaking from personal experience, uh, when formic acid is sprayed into an open cut, it can be painful. Now, this is an example of a typical nest entrance. This is on a maple tree here on campus at NC State. It's probably an old pruning cut from years ago, and it didn't heal over either because it was too large a wound or the cut wasn't done well. So some decay got started here in this cavity, and then the carpenter ants got in there. And every spring, I'll see piles of fresh sawdust uh, around the base of this tree or caught in the bark where they are excavating the wood. Unlike termites, carpenter ants don't actually feed on the wood. They merely excavate the wood for their colony. Like most other ants, carpenter ants are predators. They, they need insect prey of some sort that they uh, use to feed to their larvae for, so for growth. Uh, the adults themselves, the workers, the soldiers, they, they prefer sweet things, energy foods, so stuff that is sugary. But um, a tree that has carpenter ants infesting it like this, it may live for, for decades with this kind of injury. You, it's really you don't know what's going on inside the tree. And I even saw one instance where a carpenter ant colony was going into a maple tree through a fairly small opening, and the tree eventually closed that hole over on its own, just grew callus tissue around the opening and, and apparently killed off the carpenter ant colony. So that can happen. OK, I'll move on to some other kinds of critters here. I'm sure that uh, many, if not most of you, have been outside in your yard or in the, in the natural area fairly in the morning and seen all these webs you know, caught up in the vegetation with, with dew in them like this. And if you're like me, you wondered, well, what, what's doing this? This is a species of spider, sometimes called the bull and doily spider, Frontinella communis. And this picture was taken last month in Guilford County. Uh, homeowner you know, saw these things in the kind of the rough border between his yard and the woods and sent us an image to see what this thing was. This is a close-up of the web. You can actually see the spider down here. Uh, I believe this is a, it's either an arborvitae or a Leyland cypress, perhaps. Uh, this is where it gets the name bowl and doily. You've got the upper part of the web here shaped kind of like a bowl and underneath a flatter sheet web shaped like a doily. Uh, it's quite an undertaking for a spider this small to produce such a large web, but they're very common around here in the spring of the year. I've seen them in my own yard. And uh, for a long time, I actually wondered what they were. I never bothered to collect any to bring them in. This is the spider itself. It belongs to the family Linotheidae. Uh, Linotheids are a large family of mostly tiny spiders, uh, even the biggest ones that could only be called small at best. And the majority of the species of linotheid spiders spin their webs in, in leaf litter or other hidden locations. Some of them live in caves. Some of them may live in animal burrows, uh, but usually in, in well-concealed locations. I see some of the larger ones, like this frontinella, they may spin their webs up in vegetation and uh, therefore be more conspicuous. And just in general, you see spider webs a lot when you go out early in the morning. You can see them in shrubbery. You can see them in the lawns. You see, where did all those darn spiders come from? But then as the sun comes up and dries off the dew, the webs just seem to disappear. They're still there. They're just uh, not as visible anymore. OK, uh, blister beetles. Now, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the blister beetles, the family Meloidae. This is a moderate-sized group of beetles, with about 2,200 species worldwide, and maybe 400-plus species here in North America. Many species of blister beetles are pests in the adult stage, feeding on various kinds of field crops and, and ornamentals, some fruit trees and other fruit crops. They, uh, the larvae 
of most species of blister beetles are actually parasites, or actually parasitoids, we call them. And they uh, are either in the nests of solitary bees, like many of the ground nesting bees, or they feed in the uh, eggs of grasshoppers, which are deposited in kind of a pod or capsule in the soil. Uh, blister beetles are so called because they contain cantharidin, which is a rather nasty chemical in their blood and some of their soft tissues. And uh, if it gets on your skin, it can cause uh, a severe blistering. And uh, I don't want to think about what it might do if it should get into your eye or get into your mouth. But it has been documented that livestock, cattle, horses, for example, if they ingest some dead blister beetles that's in hay that they're being fed, they may actually die from cantharidin poisoning. It's got to be a pretty horrible way to go, but it's, it's, a, it's a familiar phenomenon to veterinarians. <coughs> The species of the genus uh, Lita or Lita, there's something like 70 species of these in, the, in North America, although most of them are found in the southwestern states. We only have about three or four species of Lita here in North Carolina. And unfortunately, I was unable to identify this one from the image. This was sent in to me as an image, but I didn't get the uh, specimens itself, my, themselves, so I'm not positive the species. But our species of Lita, Lita can be found early in the spring often feeding on the blossoms of fruit trees like peach and, and apple and cherry. When disturbed, uh, blister beetles often feign death. They'll just drop, they'll curl up their legs like this, and, and just however they land, roll on their backs. If you uh, disturb them further, they are capable of oozing. Oops, uh-oh, I clicked on something wrong here, and Mike's going to have to help me get back. Sorry about that, folks. They can actually ooze drops of blood from the joints of their leg like this. And let's say this blood, if it gets on your skin, looks kind of oily. Uh, if it gets on your skin, uh, they say it can cause uh, a blistering or burning effect. All right, I'm going to finish up my talk here. I actually do it within time uh, with, with something a little on the pretty side. This is a Luna moth of arguably uh, our most beautiful, or certainly one of our most beautiful moths. Mike Munster collected this at his home here in Wake County just last week. Uh, adults of Luna moths have been found uh, coming to lights as early as the last week of March here in North Carolina. They, uh, depending on the weather, the late March, uh, usually April is when they're going to show up. There are some tropical species that look like this but are much larger in size. Uh, Luna moth maybe three, four inches across. Some of the tropical species several inches across. The males of the Luna moths and other species of the large Saturnid moths have these, these huge feathery antennae. Female antennae are much smaller than this. The, the males use them to track the, uh, the pheromones of the females for mating purposes. And uh, the, the pheromones may be present in the air in uh, you know, only in parts per million or possibly even parts per billion. So it, it sometimes uh, studies have shown that maybe just a few chemicals of the pheromone of a moth may be enough to trigger recognition by a male insect when it's searching for a female. However, um, males in uh, most other families of moths get by with much uh, smaller antennae than this. So I'm not sure why the Saturnids seem to need such elaborate hardware. Maybe it's just because the adults are fewer and farther between than the moths of most other species. And so the males may have a greater distance to travel to find a potential female, potential mate. The larva. Uh, the Luna moth is uh, typical of other Saturday moths. It's about three, three and a half inches long, a large, green, rather slow moving. And when it's resting upside down on a stem or on a leaf, it's surprisingly well camouflaged in foliage despite its uh, size. There's over a dozen genera of trees that have been reported as uh, host plants for the Luna moth. Some of the more popular hosts include birch, hickory, persimmon, sweet gum, and walnut. Uh, most species of Saturnian moths have a variable number of generations per year. One generation may be in the far northern extreme of, its, of their ranges, and you get along the Gulf Coast or in Florida, there may be up to three generations a year. Not all of them are like this, however. The Cecropia moth, which is otherwise a fairly typical looking Saturnian moth, seems to have only one generation a year, regardless of how, north, how far north or south they're occurring. And uh, it seems to be locked into that one generation a year mode. There are many parasites, uh, invertebrate parasites and predators, and also various uh, 
vertebrate predators, birds, mammals, snakes, lizards uh, that eat the larvae of Saturnian moths. Uh, so many get uh, destroyed. Uh, it's a wonder that any of them survive to maturity at all. And if you've ever, as a kid, as I did, tried raising a caterpillar only to have a, a wasp or a tachinid fly emerge from it, you know how disappointing that is. I'm going to stop now uh, and ask if there are any questions, and then turn that on over to Mike. All right. I just want to say one more thing then. Uh, for those of you folks in the easternmost counties, if you are encountering the kudzu bugs, bean potaspids out your way, uh, if you would uh, you know, send us information on that um, so we can you know, document that they're in additional counties, especially either the border counties along Virginia or those counties right along the coast. They're probably there. Uh, you're probably seeing them. Uh, we just would like to be able to say for certain so that we can add them to our records. Oh, I forgot. Mike just reminded me of something. I, one of the uh, sets of images that I got in, which I did not include, somebody uh, about a week and a half ago was uh, along the beach down at Sunset Beach, uh, and she studies beach drift that comes up, looking for the kinds of animals that uh, get washed up like that. And she was encountering huge numbers of these things along Sunset Beach in Brunswick County, and she'd never seen them before. This year is the first time ever. And she sent it, the images out to uh, a list serve, and somebody forwarded them to me, and I was able to identify them. They probably just got blown out to sea by prevailing winds and uh, weren't strong enough flyers to make it back to land and ended up in the surf probably by the, the uncounted millions. Let's see, uh, question. Um, how do you kill the kudzu bug? OK, there should be some information on one of those websites. Uh, one of them is from NC State, but also University of Georgia. They look for whatever chemical recommendations are listed there. Uh, excuse me, is the carpenter ant the only ant that on termites? No, it is not. Actually, the one, the invasive species called the Chinese needle ant, which I have not done a special on here, but that's an introduced species that is kind of quite unlike carpenter, excuse me, unlike the red imported fire ants, which are very conspicuous and invade our lawns and actively attack us. The Chinese needle ant is uh, much more subtle. It's a woodland species, and it seems to uh, major be a major predator on termites now. Whether they're having any actual impact on termite populations is very difficult to measure, and I don't know if that's been documented yet. But uh, probably just about any predatory species of ant will feed on termites if they get the opportunity. Uh, somebody asked about washed up ashore. Somebody sent uh, images of the bean platyspid slash kudzu bug that were washing up on the shore at Sunset Beach in Brunswick County. OK, it's uh, 11.30, and now it is Mike's turn. You're getting some well-deserved applause there, Dave. All right, and uh, Dave assured me, by the way, that that moth was going to be released into the wild at his place. And uh, of course, I had, uh, had to have uh, a deal struck with my kids, who were the ones who actually collected it, that it was going to be released. All right, well, Lucy told you to buckle your seat belts, so I am going to uh, give you a chance to unbuckle your seat belts here. <coughs> Stand up and stretch for just a second, because uh, the <coughs> plant identification talk reminded me of a little story I heard about the guy who took a course in improving your memory. And he was telling a friend about this and saying how great it was and the different techniques for memory improvement that they were learning by associations and visualization and so forth. And uh, so the friend asked, well, so then that, that sounds really good. Well, who was the, who was the teacher? I think I'd like to get in on that course myself. And he said, oh, OK. Now here, this is, I'm going to show you how we use the techniques that, they, that, uh, that she taught us here. Now what? Let me think now. He says, OK, what's the name of that plant that has nice smelling flowers but thorns on it? And his friend says, um, you mean a rose? Yeah, yeah, a rose. Rose, what was the name of the teacher of that memory course that we took? So hopefully a few things here will also uh, stick with with you. <coughs> uh, we have a blank slide. Oh, let's have some blank slides here. One moment. All right, Dave, 
had a lot of wonderful uh, facts and information here. Unfortunately, some of the things that I'm going to show you are not closed cases yet, so I'm titling my presentation this month as Observations, Conjectures, and a Few Facts. And I, of course, as usual, want uh, participation from you folks. And one of the things that I want to uh, talk about, though, is the kind of a continuation of what Larry Grand had done last uh, time, two months ago, with his macro fungi. And one of the fungi that he didn't talk about, but you may encounter or some people may bring to your attention and ask about, is this one. And this picture is actually from our greenhouses here on campus. And you can see the beginnings of a mushroom growing from the potting mix here. It will eventually open up and become a very uh, typical parasol-shaped mushroom bright yellow in color uh, with some scales or hairs on it. And the question that I am going to pose to you, if we can, oh, I see Lee Jay has already popped up the four option question responses here to that side of the screen. So please click on the letter corresponding to which you think is a true statement about the mushroom in this photograph. Give you about five more seconds here. Okay, so it looks like of the about half who replied, the majority or the plurality have the correct answer. Yes, this is reported to be poisonous, and we should treat it at least as uh, being potentially poisonous and not eat it if we see it. Uh, However, it is not a parasite. It occurs probably more often indoors than out around here. And it's certainly not an endangered species. We do encounter it fairly frequently. So C would be the correct answer. Here's another picture of the same pot or a nearby pot in the greenhouse. And you can see that sometimes they'll come up in little clusters like this. The scientific name of this is currently Leucocoprinus birnbaumii, which is the uh, frontier consequence of some of these scientific name changes. The older, maybe more familiar name of Lepiota lutea was a lot more manageable. Several common names you'll see for this, the lemon yellow lepiota is one, or the yellow pleated parasol, or the flower pot parasol mushroom. I did come across in one reference that this is a tropical species, but is actually common in North America, in the south, and then uh, under indoor conditions farther north. And you'll find this in house plants, in greenhouses, in planters in shopping malls, and I have seen it once outdoors here actually on campus. The important thing to remember is that it does not harm the plants in any way. It is not a parasite. It is a saprophytic fungus. This is a sample we got into the clinic a couple of years ago with sort of yellow pills all around the outside of the root ball, just inside the wall of the pot. And I suspect that this was another manifestation of that same fungus where it does form sclerotia. And I think that it hadn't formed the fruiting body yet above ground, but that this was, well, I'll just say possibly the same fungus, but as it's uh, in its vegetative state in the pot. Of course, all fungi, all filamentous fungi, have hyphae or mycelium, which form the body of the fungus as it's growing and absorbing nutrients. I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about what we call abiotic problems, which comes from the prefix a, not, being attached to the word biotic or living. So these are things that are causing problems on our plants, but are not uh, infectious diseases. And one of the ones that I want to start with here is something that we've observed 
uh, those of us in the clinic and also people who we've talked to of a problem from, we think, the mild winter. And as you can see on this tree, which I think is a Zelkova, there's been uneven leaf out. Some of the leaves in the upper portion here of the crown are older and already have their dark summer green color, and some of the leaves here have also got um, have, are more recent, and so we've got uneven leaf out. And where we've seen that most often is in the red maples in our landscapes around here. And talking with Chuck Hodges about this, talking with Eric Honeycutt from the Bartlett Tree Research Company's diagnostic lab near Charlotte, we have a hypothesis, a conjecture of what may be occurring here, that there's some interaction between the mild winter, the warm spring, and the genotypes of some of these, particularly the red maples, that's causing this uneven leaf out to happen among, between, and within trees. And part of my hypothesis is that some of the more northern adapted or northern germplasms cultivars of these red maples are not responding well to the warm winter that we had, and it's causing confusion when it comes time to leaf out. Add to that the fact that some of these have accumulated stress from the urban environment, maybe from being in the south where they're not as well adapted. So I think that's the case in the tree at the left here, getting some stress over the years and contributing to the to the situation and why we're not seeing terribly good leaf out on these maples. So the thing to do here would be a wait and see attitude how these things are going to go as we get into the summer. But Eric asked me to ask you folks, how many of you have seen something similar to this? So please, let's see, I think I can go back to our our yes, no options. If you would, put a green check if you've seen problems with uneven leaf out, especially with the red maples in your area, and a red X if you have not observed that. All right, OK, all the way out in Allenslow. A few people just west of here not seeing it. It doesn't seem, I can't uh, at least pick out any particular pattern to where it's being seen and not seen here. Uh, Brian reporting he has noticed them leaving with ash species. Okay, now that's interesting. All right, thank you. Another abiotic problem that we have seen on a few occasions here. Does anybody want to take a stab at what this is? It's oak leaf holly is the plant, a type of hybrid holly. No takers? All right, I think what we're dealing with are actually two different problems. One of them is frost damage. We had that late, not a real hard freeze in this area, but a late freeze, and that is what's causing the blackening of some of these tips. We've got actually a couple of uh, inquiries about damage on this kind of holly. And the larger blotches, I'm not sure, again, getting to my conjectures here, but I think this may be sun scald. It's fairly typical of what you would see as a, a sun scald type injury or some other kind of abiotic or environmental problem. And it's interesting in this case how we can see there are fungal fruiting bodies here in this spot. Well, this one was Calatotricum. Fungal fruiting bodies in this spot turn out to be Philosticta, and no fungal fruiting bodies in this spot. So that's a clue that neither of the fungi here are actually responsible for the damage. They're incidental there. They may have done even what are called endophytes, living within the plant tissue, and that popped out, started fruiting when that tissue died. All right, Seth, yes, I agree with you. Now, Johnson County, could the chilling hour deficit cause dogwoods not to flower? That is a good question and one beyond my skills. Brian, Lucy, do either of you want to take a stab at that? I had not noticed problems with dogwoods not blooming, at least in our area. I haven't seen that either. No, neither have I. I've, I've seen uh, nothing unusual as far as dogwood blooms. 
but could that uh, potentially happen? Well, I never say never, but but um, I've never heard of that happening. I've noticed. Uh, I've not noticed that with dogwood, but I have noticed that with the spring glow cornelian cherry cornus moss. Uh, it requires uh, pretty substantial chilling hours, and its flowering seemingly was a little off this year compared to other years. But with dogwood, I have not seen that. But possible, yes. But with dogwood, personally, I haven't observed it. I think the proof of the pudding is going to be see how the French lilacs do, since uh, they, of course, are uh, do better where they get more cold. And it would be a shame if we don't get flowers on those this year. I'll be paying attention. Right here is another example of what I believe is sun skull, but this is old damage on an Akuba shrub here on campus. And again, you get these large blotches. In this case, it turned black. And in this case, also just one per leaf. So we're not seeing a lot of little spots like we might see with uh, an infectious disease. Though I'm not saying you couldn't have more than one on a leaf. This is another very common problem. And the picture is from a landscape here in Raleigh from last year, but the, I think the, or actually two years ago. But the principle applies in any season. And here we've got a row of fairly recently planted Japanese hollies in this landscape that had been recently renovated. And you can see it looks like a fairly well-drained site. And you can also see a little drip line there. So they're probably getting good irrigation. But yet some of the plants are doing poorly, especially this one here and this one here. And it turns out, we think this is a one-two punch, or a combination of high soluble salts with hydrophobic soil. The salts index on the plant or the soil associated with the plant on the right here was 150 on our scale that we use, which is very high for a landscape shrub or tree, or even a, a landscape herbaceous plant. And those salts, of course, normally come from fertilizers. But in this case, they couldn't really leach away because the soil was repelling water rather than allowing it to penetrate. And here's a picture showing what this looks like on a different plant, a sample that we got in the clinic, where a drop of water applied to the surface of the potting mix here just sits and doesn't actually go in and wet the substrate or the roots. So how do we deal with the situation or even recognize it? Well, if you're a producer, one of the things you want to make sure is to keep your piles, your windrows of substrate, your bark substrate, turned and not allow those to dry out. As a consumer, one thing you can do is watch out that you're not buying plants that are pot bound. The person whose landscape that was in the pictures replanted, had the same problem, got new plants again, and planted them himself. And he said that they were less pot bound than what he had. And he uh, says they're doing fine. So here's a great example of where you want to know whether or not you've got a disease. Because had that been a root disease that was causing his problems, then he would not have wanted to go back with the same kind of plant. When you do transplant, make sure to take the outer portion of that root ball and tease the roots out, get rid of that bark mix so that those roots are in contact with natural soil when they get planted. And of course, irrigate properly, not too much, not too little. And check. Make sure that after a rain, after an irrigation, you can see that those roots are getting wet. Uh, Dr. Anthony LeBude gave us some of this information and also commented that wetting agents in the landscape are probably not going to do much good. So that's not something that you would want to try and recommend in terms of dealing with these hydrophobic substrates. Right, here's another situation. 
It would be cruel, I think, to ask people if they recognize this because it was a little bit of an unusual situation. This is a hollyhock here in Wake County. And uh, it turns out that what happened here was the homeowner had covered the plants in anticipation of the freeze of uh, 10 days ago or so, and then forgot to take the cover off, and the plants got burned, burning off the nice flower stalk that was forming there and the, uh, even causing some damage on the leaves. But here is an actual disease on the hollyhock. So we're going to switch away from now our abiotic problems and talk about bona fide diseases for a few minutes. And most of you will probably recognize this. I see Brenda has already entered in the correct diagnosis. This is hollyhock rust, in fact, caused by the fungus Puccinia malvaceorum. Yellow spots on the upper surface of the leaf, somewhat indented, dimple-like, and then on the lower surface of the leaf, the brownish, orangish pustules of the rust fungus. These spores are then blown or splashed to new leaves. It usually works its way up from the lower leaves of the plant uh, and then hitting progressively younger foliage and could cause quite a bit of damage to the hollyhock. Rusts do tend to be host specific though. So in this photograph, the rust that's on the foxtail plant leaf on the left is not the same rust as on the malva on the right. But I include this picture because that particular weed, the malva, does host the same rust fungus that gets on the hollyhock. It does not require an alternate host like some rusts do, but it can survive on that weed. So that's part of your management strategy. We can list a few here as to what to do to prevent this disease. One will be sanitation, including eliminating those mallow weeds. Also, end of the year cleanup, make sure all the dead plant debris is removed. And you can even remove diseased leaves during the year to try and reduce the amount of inoculum. Since it does require water to infect, anything you can do to reduce the leaf wetness is going to help, making sure you've got a sunny site with good air movement, timing your irrigation so that leaves will dry quickly, in other words, not watering late at night, and avoid wetting the leaves if you can when you are irrigating. Fungicides can be used to try and combat this disease. For example, uh, chlorothalonil-based fungicides such as dacanil will be available to homeowners. Mycobutanil is another active ingredient that can be used, also available to homeowners. And I have read that neem oil can be used against hollyhock rust. Here is a Rudbeckia, a black-eyed Susan, with some spots on it. And let's switch back to our A through D. Oh, you were quicker than I was. Lee J, thank you. This one is not as straightforward as you might think because the spots are a bit unusual. They're reddish, different sizes, somewhat round but somewhat angular. You don't have a as definite a shape as some spots do. And how many, let's see, give you another couple of seconds here. I can, I can almost hear the discussions going on in the rooms with multiple master gardeners. All right, let's see what we've got. All right, well, as it turns out, bacterium is not a bad guess because they are somewhat angular and there is a bacterial disease on Rudbeckia. No one picked nematode. A few people picked virus. You might suspect uh, somewhat virus-like symptoms, but then again, we're not seeing anything on the newest growth here, so you would maybe suspect not. And as it turns out, this is a fungal disease. This turns out to be septoria leaf spot. 
And we talked about septoria before on plants passing pathogens, but for tomatoes. And this particular septoria is a different species. It is specific to Rudbeckia and Radibidia, a prairie cone flower, so it will not spread to your tomatoes. But again, being a fungal disease, it likes water, so avoid overhead irrigation on your plants. Practice sanitation, keep those dead leaves cleaned up, especially at the end of the year. And here again, you can use some protectant fungicides to try and get ahead of this. Don't try and use them as curatives, but something like, again, a chlorothanol containing product like a daconil or a mancozeb containing product, if you can find one, can be used as protectants to prevent new foliage becoming infected. Here's one we're still working on. These are leaves on some very small Japanese maples, actually at my sister-in-law's. And the very noticeable tan spots are, uh, are particularly obvious because of the dark color on the leaves. I'm not sure yet if this is going to be Philosticta or Oreobacidium. I found Philosticta in some of these spots, but some pictures that are published very much like this are listed as being Oreobacidium. So I'm going to keep an eye on the incubations and decide. But even without knowing that, I just want to remind everyone of the general principle or rule of thumb that leaf spot diseases of hardwoods are not serious threats to the health of the tree. So we're talking about a cosmetic problem that may be worse in some years than in others, but I wouldn't necessarily reach for the sprayer in this case. And I would also want to know, is this something that is going to be causing new infections or is this going to stop? It seems to me when I've seen this disease in the past that at this time of year, maybe a little bit later in the spring, it reaches its maximum and it doesn't really change much after that. Now, of course, when you still have new leaves coming out, they uh, could, I imagine, become yet infected. But unless you've got a specimen tree in front of a five-star restaurant or something, then I wouldn't worry about it. In this case, my sister-in-law had watered these things over the top, so there's probably a factor there of the increased water giving her more problems than she needed to have. All right. Going to the A through E choices. I think this may be my last question of uh, multiple choice on the program. What disease is this of rose? We have A black spot, B botrytis blight, C a sarcosp relief spot, D a downy mildew, or E a powdery mildew. Well, let's see, for those who were daring enough to attempt an answer and quick enough before I jumped in. I see that uh, no one was fooled by black spot. And a few people thought maybe Sir Cosper, but actually, in fact, this is downy mildew of rose, caused by the fungus-like organism Paranospora sparsa. And that name is important because it is a clue that the sporulation of this fungus, which only is going to occur on the underside of the leaf, can be quite sparse. So you may not notice it, especially with the unaided eye. But the symptoms are fairly typical. Reddish, somewhat angular, may have yellow halos around them, and then with leaf drop. Fortunately, though, this is almost exclusively a problem for nurseries. It can be a huge problem in nurseries and spread rapidly under cool, wet conditions. But I have only seen it once from a landscape sample, and that was one that had been planted fairly recently. It was interesting that um, I'd like to use this comparison for class and show downy mildew spots on the left, letter A, black spot, of course, being darker and with a feathered margin in B, but both of which can be associated with chlorosis or yellowing, and then Sarcosper relief spot, which we mentioned in plants, pests, and pathogens last year, on the right in letter C. 
None of these, of course, would you confuse with powdery mildew, shown here on the left, from the same sample, or downy mildew on the right. Remember, powdery mildew can occur both on the upper and underside of the leaf, whereas the downy mildew signs, the sporulation of the fungus, will be present only on the underside of the leaf, if at all. There are a number of downy mildew, I'm sorry, powdery mildews that are already getting cranked up outdoors this year on rose, on euonymus, and on Gerbera daisy. We'll probably be seeing it uh, before too long on dogwood, although of course it's a little more subtle there. Keep an eye for it on the Gothi, of course. And the management, well, a little bit late now, but during dormancy pruning may be useful for uh, managing powdery mildews. Remember not to over fertilize because that lush growth is especially appetizing to the powdery mildew fungi. In many cases, host resistance, choosing the right species or cultivars, can help you with having less problems with powdery mildew. And fungicides do have their place. Fortunately, there are a lot of active ingredients in the market that will be effective against powdery mildews. Unfortunately, they tend to become insensitive to those products with exposure over time. And also, unfortunately, you have to have a fairly frequent spray interval to keep ahead of the reproduction of the powdery mildew. Whether or not it's worth it or not is a little bit of a complicated calculus. I would say that since they cause so little damage and it's so difficult to treat trees that it's not worth it there. On the other end of the spectrum, something like euonymus is so susceptible that you're not going to win anyway. But that in-between area, some plants in the landscape, such as rose, could benefit from spray protectants. Uh, and in the greenhouse and nursery, of course, you have another whole dynamic going on that in some cases you do need to use some kind of chemical control. What can we use for powdery mildews? Conventional fungicides, DMIs, and the strobilurins, those that would be available to homeowners would be things uh, containing mycobutanil and tebuconazole. Some of the biorationals, the softer pesticides, are not going to be as effective. It may give you some a control, such as by potassium bicarbonate, relative of baking soda, neem oil, and petroleum oil. It can be careful, especially with the oils and sulfurs, that you're not causing burn under high temperatures or combining sulfurs with oils. Um, Gina, yes, I don't know about vermicompost sprays. I had not heard of that. But uh, baking soda, or better yet, one of the potassium bicarbonate products can be used against powdery mildews. All right, other things that we want to be watching for between now and our next program. In the vegetable garden, haven't talked about vegetables today, but maybe we'll correct that by, by next time. Keep an eye out for tomato spotted wilt virus. We've been seeing that already. Got a sample in today that looks like tomato spotted wilt. It came from a tunnel type situation. Septoria leaf spot on tomato, which could be confused with tomato spotted wilt, will be coming in as well. And three diseases whose main symptom is wilting, southern blight, southern bacterial wilt, and root knot nematode, will also be things to watch for in the coming months. We had featured these on plants, pests, and pathogens in different times during the last couple of years. For trees, shrubs, and flowers, there's a lot going to be out there in the next couple of months, including rose rosette. Remember, that can be tricky to diagnose, but super hyperthorniness is one thing that is a fairly surefire symptom for that, although it is not always present. Quince rust on ornamental pear, especially on the fruits that will be coming out in June, we'll be seeing. And of course, oak leaf blister. We had a really good year for oak leaf blister last year, and it'll be interesting to see what is going to happen this year. Finally, it was brought to our attention by Dr. Kelly Ivers yesterday that the potato late blight was strong in Florida already. And for those who have potato or tomato interests, you can keep an eye on things through the website usablight.org. Thanks, Mike. Any questions for Mike? I see you getting lots of applause. OK, well, I uh, just want to finish up with a couple of dates that you might want to keep in mind. Uh, I've got a Chris, you have a question or a comment? Oh, 
that was a clapping. Okay, great. Okay, so there are several different calendars listed up here where you can get information about opportunities um, across the um, you know, in general gardening or community gardening or for master gardeners specifically. A couple of dates that are coming up, the Southern Region Master Gardener Conference is going to be in Natchez, Mississippi, May 1st through the 4th. And then our North Carolina State Master Gardener Conference will be in Asheville, May 20th to the 23rd. And there's a link to more information about the, the conference. Also, you might want to get on your calendar now, September 7th through the 14th. Uh, is the International Master Gardener Conference, and that's going to be a um, cruise along the coast of Alaska, with every port of call being horticultural tours and uh, conference workshops and, and sessions happening on the boat. Anybody have any questions? All right, well, thank you very much for being here. I appreciate everybody typing your names in and numbers. That will help, help me. And we'll look forward to seeing you at the next session. And Carrie's saying, if you aren't signed up yet for the Master Gardener Conference, please do so immediately. There's a, a link uh, right here to information, and you can also Google that. All right, happy stream to everyone. We'll see you at the next session.